Celtic Stuff Live. Welcome to Celtic Stuff Live on the CLNS Media Network, the leading online provider of audio and video coverage for the Boston Celtics. I'm your host, Justin Poole, and joining me, as always, John Duke. And we predicted our undefeated week a week early, so thank goodness it does turn out that more practice and a little bit of rest and sticking around at home has been good for this Celtics team. They go 3-0 and since we were last on the show. They beat the Pelicans, and they get a big, long break, which you and I kind of grumbled about a little bit. And then they had that back-to-back a at home and then away with the Cleveland Cavaliers on Friday night and then a matchup against the, I would have said, red-hot Minnesota Timberwolves after the trade of Jimmy Butler. But uh, we broke that little winning streak that they had going, or maybe it wasn't a winning streak, but still um, – Really nice turnaround for that club. The Celtics wind up snapping that. And Gordon Hayward goes off, which was really nice to see. Although, if you watch the game, there's never really a moment where you felt like he took over. Uh, he really spread that near triple-double throughout the night, which is exactly how it should look with Gordon Hayward. So, good signs all around this past week, John. Yeah, I mean, I think from where we were a week ago when we recorded – and things were pretty bleak. Things were pretty dire. Uh, <laughs> it was it was it was a rough place to be as a, to do a podcast for the Celtics. You know, they had that nice win, uh, you know, in in Atlanta, and then that stinker in Dallas, and just you know, that was they lost four out of five games. I mean, that that's as bad as it gets right there. And I think over this last week we saw now you could say they've won four of the five last games. Uh, they, they've, I think they've turned the corner. I think they really have. I think they've figured out who they are a little bit. They've recaptured some of that toughness thanks to Smart, thanks to Morris, and and everyone found their roles a little bit easier. Uh, and part of that also has been players have been out of the lineup. You know, whether it's Jalen Brown and and uh, Al Horford on Friday night. We've had a couple of different instances where it's not, they're not working so hard to try to make sure everyone's happy. They're just letting the game come to them. They're letting the flow happen. And well, I and they're passing enjoy- successfully. I mean, the ball movement and the turnovers to create some transition buckets and actually defensively during that stretch, it's not like they've been the, that top defensive team that they've been. Um, it's kind of, they've done a little bit of what I said, like increase the tempo a little bit, get the pace up on offense, sacrifice a little bit on defense. I think overall the net rating is going to be better. Um, I'm not saying that they're not playing good defense because they are, but they're obviously giving up more points because of the pace of the game. And that is something that needed to happen. I just felt like their energy would rise if the pace of play rose. And they've got enough depth on this team. There's no reason they're not playing up tempo. So uh, they're still in the half-court set. They're still one of the slower teams overall. But comparative to what we saw through the first, you know, I don't know, 20 games, maybe 18 games of the year, depending on where you think uh, the pace increased, um, it's been substantial. And it's, and it's what they're going to need to be able to compete with the teams out west, too. And, and you know uh, Dan Greenberg, uh, Stool Greeny, um, the, uh, the Barstool uh, Celtics blogger, he had a tweet today, and he said, you know, since the seventh of of November, the Celtics have had the tenth best offense since the twenty fourth, since the um, F Thanksgiving uh, comment, they've had the fifth best offense in basketball, and the last week they've had the best offense in basketball. Now, I don't think, I mean, certainly when you play against teams like. <laughs> As bad as the ones the Celtics have played this week. I don't think that's sustainable over the long haul, but I do think that a top 10 offense is definitely within the, uh, the realm of possibility. Whether or not over the long, over the course of the year playing so badly for a quarter of the season, that will bear itself out. But at least when they get there, uh, I think that the Celtics will have a, a potent offense that does all the things we expect it to. There's going to be some pieces they have to fit back in, pieces who've been pulled from the team, and now they have to reintegrate. We're going to talk about that certainly later on the show. But the fact that they've been able to make it work and share the ball and everyone seemed to find their opportunities wherever they were and let the the game kind of find whoever needs to shoot as opposed to this kind of uncomfortable thing where – 
you know, it's like the heat in 2011 where they were kind of taking turns. Now it's just, it's just kind of, it all comes within the flow. And I, I think you're right. And I think the pace has been better too, to your point. That's something we've talked about a lot. Pace has been a lot better in part of it. They've, I think they've created some turnovers, but I think they're trying to push it just a little bit more and try to create some more opportunities, more scoring chances for the team. And I'd be more down on the opponents of the last week if it weren't for the fact that the Pelicans got a big man inside. You've got a big man inside with the T-Wolves. And Cleveland has, they beat Philly. They've been known to, to punch somebody in the mouth here and there. Only four wins on the year. Worst team in the Eastern Conference. But it's not like they don't play hard. Um, I felt like they played pretty hard during that game. Kyrie just out with a mission, right? He just wants to face that old team. And he was shooting from, what, five steps back from the three-point line. <laughs> You're really taking some liberties to kind of stick it to the franchise, I think. But either way, I would say I am would put that into more context. But you and I even said when we were making our predictions for this week that we thought that this team really wasn't going to be able to get a win against the Pel- Pelicans and the T-Wolves because of the big man. They'd have, they'd had trouble getting to the rim and they had trouble defending at the basket. And that did change this week. They both got, they not only got to the rim, were able to score a lot more close up and get those easier baskets. They were more aggressive other than Kyrie Irving. There were other players that were attacking the basket. And, and we will talk about Morris and Smart, like you said, because Morris has just been so automatic, which has helped space that out, I think, as well. But defensively, they've definitely been um, a little bit more of a presence inside. I'm not saying Anthony Davis and, and Carl Anthony Towns didn't get to do what they wanted to do. They, they both had you know fairly typical nights for them against the Seas. But overall, you're expecting that. It was the rest of the team wasn't dominating them in the paint. I don't know if it's 100% going to be rested at the feet of Marcus Smart and his perimeter defense, but that was the real call, right? Brad kept saying, defensively, we are not at the point of attack on the perimeter, and then that's what's really killing us inside. So it sure seems to point some signs when you see the energy of Marcus Smart over the last week that that may be the case, but that's what we're about to get into. First, I'm going to remind everybody that you can follow Celtic Stuff Live on Twitter at CSL underscore tweet. Follow me at CSL underscore Justin. John is at CSL underscore Duke. The entire CLNS Media Network at CLNS Media. Facebook.com slash CLNS fans. Download the CLNS Media app for iOS and Android. Simply search CLNS Media in your app marketplace. And YouTube.com slash CLNS Media for high-definition, full-length locker room interviews and the Garden Report, as well as a video of Celtic Stuff Live. If you've been a long-time listener but not a watcher, definitely go to YouTube. Find us under the playlist there. So, John, we have to start out with Marcus and Marcus, right? I mean, that's really been the biggest changes. Those are two players that we felt like at least one had the energy. The other one was the best Celtics player, arguably, through the first 20 games of the season coming off the bench. Some questions about whether that would reduce the scoring for the bench unit. Some concerns about whether or not he would be able to keep up that pace against opposing uh, starting lineups. But the truth is, is he's still finding himself wide open. He's absolutely clutch from beyond the arc, obviously talking about Marcus Morris Senior. And then we have Marcus Smart, who all of a sudden is hitting his three-pointers, man. He's hitting his three-pointers. <laughs> Senor? <laughs> I, you're not going to just let me slide that in there. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm just, I can't. I, I just, it's there, you know. Um, no, I, they're both, they've provided, um, they've both provided what the Celtics have needed. Um, and it's funny to say that Morris would be that among that group. Smart, I think, is a little bit easier to understand. He's, um, you know, he, he's, he's a ball handler. He's, he's a guy who makes the right play. He is prone to take maybe too many shots, but he's someone who really knows how to manufacture uh, or run the offense. I think, I think he's a good playmaker. Uh, and defensively, certainly we know, um, what he can do. And, and the fact he just makes winning plays, rebounding, whatever is needed, he does. Well, speaking of winning plays, probably one of the best, 
uh, mm-hmm. moments of basketball in the last, I'd say, almost several years in terms of just creativity. But getting the deflection, falling to the ground, the ball gets tapped right back into his hands, fires it from his back down the court, an absolute strike to Tatum, who dumps it off to Morris, then finds good position, takes the alley-oop, and knocks it down. Uh, mm-hmm. That was just really a pretty play. Obviously, there's nobody listening to this show that hasn't seen that. It was all over Twitter, all over everywhere. Uh, but just what creativity. And that's that. I think uh, Scalabrini talked about during the tip uh, – during the game about how Marcus is always looking where other guys are well before the ball even gets into his hands. It's like he knows where they are on the court. Those are the kinds of things you and I have been talking about for a long time in our defense of him considering his shooting woes through the first four years of his career. Yeah, I mean, he's – that he has an innate sense about him. It's the only thing that makes sense in terms of him being a guy who makes these winning plays, right? He has to have this kind of – you know, geometrical, uh, just sen- sense about him where he, he can lay out the geography of the court and where the important landmarks are and sees things ahead. That's the only thing that makes sense for play, players who do what he does. Players like Rondo, pl- players like Bird, players like, you know, Magic, who just have this innate sense within them that things happen. And of course, I'm not saying smart is in that category. That would be insane. But in terms of the winning plays aspect, you know, would it surprise you to see an Eastern Conference Finals game and see Marcus Smart steal the ball like Bird did in 87, you know, and find DJ for the cutter? I mean, you can see that in your mind's eye. Celtics fans have all seen Smart do those types of things. Why couldn't he have that same sort of impact? I think we all know that's possible, and that's the only thing that makes sense. You introduce that to the starting lineup, You've got Mook, who's ISO a little bit less and is more catch and shoot with that group. And things just start to Who fall. Who also into play. is not hot dog in it. He's not hoarding right. shots. Like all the things that people might have said against his favor in the second unit, where he maybe forces some stuff. He is 100% like just knows exactly what role he's supposed yeah. to be playing. He's committing much more defensively and turning it around, even rebounding. I know they're not all going to him. Kyrie has been obviously committing himself defensively, but he's getting a lot of those longer rebounds, and I think that also has a lot to do with Marcus Morris being in there and that toughness. It's going to be interesting to see what they do. I know that Baines got the call on Friday night with Horford getting some rest. They're going to need to do that from time to time for sure. And, um, you know, they talked about it and basically said, looking at the at looking at the schedule, even though they'd had three days off leading up to that game, there's just certain nights when you'd think you might be able to get away with it. And for the older guys, and Horford is the oldest guy, uh, you got to get them rest when you can get them. And so they they did it then. Um, obviously, it didn't hurt them. They had a great night against the Cavs, but I think Marcus Morris. Might need to be staying in that starting lineup. I know everybody was concerned about it. It'll all depend a lot on Gordon Hayward, who just had a triple double. So he's going to be fighting his way back in there. But it, it's hard to look at either one of those players and yanking, yank them out of the starting line, lineup. I mean, I think ultimately it's probably going to have to be Morris, but maybe they'll flip and flop with the Marcuses. You know, you could almost see Hayward playing shooting guard. He's getting his mobility back for certain. So uh, defensively, that might still be a little bit of a risk, but to see Gordon going up and uh, taking a couple of alley-oops over the course of this week and not being afraid to do so, that was definitely a good sign. But but we'll we'll wait a minute before we go to the Gordon Hayward conversation because we're going to spend some time on that. But to finish out the Marcus and Marcus, uh, where do you kind of land on that? I mean, if one of them's got to come out of the lineup as Gordon earns his way in, who's who are you pulling out? Yeah, it's tough because I, I think Marcus Smart is probably – of who isn't in the starting lineup, they can most easily approximate his role with someone else, whether it's Hayward, whether it's Brown. Um, But on the other hand, I think Marcus Morris is probably the less impactful of the two of them. And actually, if you look at some of the the advanced stuff, I mean, you look at the box plus minus stuff, um, you know, Marcus is not a positive player in terms of the box plus minus. Now, 
Is Which that, Marcus? We're talking Marcus about Morris. Bo- Sorry, Marcus <laughs> Morris. Senior. You know, he's, you know, so right, Senor. <laughs> right. So. Senor you know, Morris, comma Marcus. There you go. Right. Now, I guess the question is, who could you put in who could do what Marcus Morris does, but also, um, you know, fill that role? What is Marcus Morris doing? He's defending. He's taking the, the, the second biggest guy on the court, defending that person. And then he's also, he's rebounding, right? So can Hayward do that? Can Brown do that? I, I have less, I, I think Hayward is probably the guy who's probably most like able to fit that Marcus Morris role and it probably would benefit him to be initially matched up on some some slower guard gar, you know sl- slower guys some, some fours uh, that might be a little bit easier for Hayward right now but I like Hayward's ability to create in that second unit so maybe when we talk a little bit more about that we'll get into that but yeah I think I think Marcus Morris is the more likely of the two in my mind to come out um I I'm just not confident of where Jalen is right now I think we need to see have a good week or two from Jalen before we can kind of start thinking about uh changes to that starting lineup in my mind yeah yeah I couldn't agree more and so uh, that's our next two topics. We're going to hit Brown when we come back from this quick advertising break, and then we're going to talk about Hayward. And we don't have another game until Thursday against the Knicks, so not a lot for the upcoming week. Uh, obviously, by the time we talk again, there'll be a couple of games under the belt. But an interesting change of pace in the schedule, one that's going to allow for a lot of practices and a lot of rest for some of these guys who got banged up but not necessarily full-on injured like we saw last year. So that's a good thing. But Brown and Hayward, big topics coming up in the second half of the show. Hey, sports fans, do you want to get killer seats to see your favorite team for just the price of a beer or a large pizza? I bet you're tired of paying all those inflated markups from brokers or the last-minute convenience charges just to end up paying courtside prices for nosebleed seats. Go to oneinone100.co. That's onein one zero zero. Dot co feeling lucky try it out now there's no other place online that's doing online raffles to win tickets to events it's a totally new way to score tickets to the boston celtics or any other event that you're interested in the cost to get tickets with one in 100 is a small fraction of the actual ticket price you can get a you can get a pair of tickets for less than the cost of a beer, and your first raffle ticket is free after signing up. The experience of using 1 in 100, extremely fun and exciting, from picking your lucky number to the feeling of potentially scoring premium tickets. Are you feeling lucky? Try it. 1 in 100.co. That's O-N-E-I-N 100 C-O. And Robinhood, an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options and cryptos all commission free. Did you hear that? This non-intimidating way for stock market newcomers to invest for the first time with true confidence. I've got friends that have been encouraging me to invest in cryptocurrencies and now I've finally done it with Robinhood's easy to use app. Other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, but Robinhood doesn't charge commission fees. Trade stocks and keep all of your profits. Learn how to invest as you build your portfolio and discover new stocks and track favorite companies with a personalized news feed. Custom notifications are also available for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving away our listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up at CelticStuff.RobinHood.com. That's CelticStuff.RobinHood.com. All right, John, we're back. It's time to talk about Brown. The biggest thing that we were really alluding to before we went to the break was that somebody's got to come out of this lineup that just started to have a lot of success with the insertion of the Marcuses. We said Hayward may be playing his way in, especially after the aggressive performance on Saturday night. But then also we've got Jalen Brown, who's been a staple last year in the starting lineup, really has almost this entire season until, you know, starting to deal with this little minor nagging injury that he's had. And if he comes back, it's hard to see him. I know we've seen him play the four a little bit, but it's hard to see him playing the four where Marcus Morris is at right now. So then I really feel like the decision is coming down to, do you put Brown back in or do you let Marcus continue 
to feed this energy and enthusiasm and make winning plays and create opportunities for others without needing the ball in his hands. And maybe Brown's better suited for that bench unit for a while to be able to attack the basket. He was getting very aggressive before the injury. One of the only guys to really start hitting the rim. I know we talked about that in the first half as being one of the things that was a significant improvement for this club. And Brown was kind of leading the charge outside of Kyrie before he went down. So how do you slice this one? Does he earn his way back in? Do they just give it to him and put Marcus back on the bench? Or do you kind of have to not mess with the success that Marcus Smart has brought to the starting lineup? I'm probably of the mode that three games is not enough to really make a change right now. Um, I I think, I think Jalen, I worry about Jalen's ability to react to being on the bench. Remember when you and I were doing shows, uh, his rookie year and having conversations about you know, how much better he plays when he was in the starting lineup. There was a period when Avery Bradley was out for an extended spell and he really kind of stood up and, and, and played much better in that starting position. And so I wonder what we're going to get from Jalen coming back. I think personally, the culture that the Celtics have initiated and, and established in that starting unit. And, and really it's continuing through the rest of the, you know, into the bench and, and through the seat throughout the 48 minutes of the game. It's great. Now we're going to introduce another wing player who's going to take minutes. And you look at the minutes distribution the last time, I think Alex Kungu put it out there on, on Twitter. Where do you take the minutes from? It's going to be hard to find minutes for, for Jalen Brown. That's, that's the hard part about this is now, now we got to fit, we got to fit him in and in terms of game, how does he fit with the other players he's in? I think if you leave Hayward on the bench and you go with a Rozier, Brown, Hayward, um, you know, either Tice or, or Baines, and then probably one of the other starters kind of cycling back through, I think it's okay. If you move Hayward to the back to the starting group and let's say Morris comes back, then I get a little antsy about that. And I know, yeah, you're going to have one of probably Horford or, or Irving or, or Hayward with that second unit. But I, I just, what I like about Hayward being that second unit is his ability to play, make and create opportunities for others. And I think if they move Hayward out of that, it may not establish that ethic quite yet. I just, I'd like to see maybe Brown in that second unit. I worry about his head. I worry about him being able to be locked and keep that progress going like we saw pre-injury. But but Jalen's your guy. I, I'm I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna, you know I've gotten the, softer on that. I uh, want to hear what your thoughts are because I'm curious whether or not you think he can mentally get there. Well, you know I've gotten soft on him a little bit. That, that's on, on that whole stance for sure. And uh, I'm a, I'm a, obviously I'm still a big Brown supporter, but the issue is, you know, for me that Brown, uh, to your point, doesn't necessarily do very well off the bench. I almost feel like they kind of just need to rotate some nights off for some of these guys if they could get away with it. I mean, I know we're worried a little bit about chemistry, but I think one of the biggest impactors on chemistry today is just the lack of minutes, as you just mentioned. And like Alex Kungu said, you know, where does these minutes come from? How do we manage those minutes? I almost feel like you just let guys have a night off here and there um, and rotate it through. Let them come back in. Um, the only other thing I'll say about that with Brown is uh, I feel like he was heating up before the injury, so it's a little bit hard to make this next statement. But part of me thinks you put him on the bench and just say, listen, things are going well. Things are going really well. we got to stay with this for a little while. And you kind of let that be the impetus that when he comes back in and it's the starter, so that he never wants to go back, right? Because that's probably the psychology over the last couple of years. And then once he gets out there, I mean, some of it we decided was related to being around other players that were taking attention away from him. And if it's simply that, there's enough talent on this team, especially if Hayward's on that bench unit with him, you know, or then that bench rotation with him, that he really could still benefit as much as he has in starting lineups of past years. So I think maybe if that's really all it is, if there's also just a mental motivation thing for him, it might not be bad and it won't hurt the team 
for him to sit on the bench a little bit so that when he comes back in as a starter, he really values it and does not relinquish his hold on that position in the future. I can just see it becoming a motivator, but it's got to be done right. Um, you know, this is a proud man, a proud young man. And so the last thing you want to do is, is have him be discouraged. But at the end of the day, that's why we said roster construction, right for trade somewhere in here, just to pull all these things together. The reason you don't want to mess with Brown is because Marcus Morris, they're probably not going to be able to afford next year. He's probably not coming back. And then all of a sudden it solves the minutes issue in some ways, but the roster balance might still be an issue in terms of a true power forward. So, you know, I don't know what they do about it. I think at the end of the day, they're probably going to have to let Brown back into the starting lineup, but they'll use this to delay that a little bit. What do you think about that? No, I think it's a great idea. I think the motivation that being out of it, you know, that will provide him, uh, should be really helpful. I mean, he, I think, I don't think he's a soft guy mentally in terms of hard work, in terms of, you know, pushing through. I don't think it's, I don't think he's a lily, you know, I don't think he's, he's someone, I don't think he's an orchid. I don't think you have to worry nah, about he's that. He's just prideful. He's prideful. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I think that what I worry about though is just the culture of it and fitting the guy in. The, the minutes right now are pretty good. I think the distribution's pretty good. What I, what I worry about is a couple here, a couple from here, a couple from here. You know, like you said, and I, and I 100% agree with this. I'm okay with not messing with it right now, letting him work himself back in for the bench. But as you said, Morris is gone. And I think that the best Celtics lineup is that lineup that, that you were really hoping to start from the start of the year. That's the best lineup. That's the lineup that beats the Warriors, hopefully. Beats the, the, it's certainly the one that beats the Raptors. Oh, look That's at the, the optimism need. creep back in. And you know what though? Let's use this to transition to Hayward because, all right, we just talked about all that plug and play, da, 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 but he's in that lineup. He's mm-hmm. in the lineup. As you said, that beats the Warriors, not could beat or challenges. You're already no. making a prediction. You just Babe Ruth, the <laughs> green monster. This is the lineup that beats the Warriors. So. Here we go. Yeah. Hayward, though, very encouraging. Um, more aggressive. Kyrie said, you know, he's got a little bit of a eh, hole in him a little bit, you know, and he wanted it to come out. And he said he needed to be more aggressive. And he told him to look for a shot. And the big challenge for Gordon is how does he still stay that facilitator and make the people around him better and then also get aggressive and look for a shot? But, you know, the three pointer is definitely about to start clicking. That will oh, do yeah. wonders. That will do wonders. I mean, I get it. The lateral motion's still going to come back a little bit, but there's definitely more confidence. Um, there's, and, and I think people will started to see it way before, you know, the 39 and eight performance against the Timberwolves. Everybody was seeing it, you know, for, from all the way back to the Pelicans and maybe even a couple of nights before that. Well, well, and this is, you know, I think people have been on his case way too much. I mean, it, he had a great – his best performances were against Toronto, the win against Toronto, the win against the the Bucks. Um, you know, he's had good performances throughout the season. I mean, I think it's – I think that we – because he hasn't been max player all-star Gordon Hayward throughout, it's been, well, he can't do this, he can't do that. I mean, I think those folks need to just settle down a little bit. But I think what you're talking about is, is right on. He's – He's not 39 and 9 or 39 and 8. He's, that's not going to be his every night thing, but you could see that he's building towards that. That confidence is there. Friday night, his effort was stupendous. I mean, again, it's not a great team. The Cavs aren't exactly world beaters. Uh, but when they pushed that lead out and really went to, you know, a higher plane as a team, he was on that court. He was a big part of, of them making that push. I think that that's where uh, that's where this team goes into another level. You know, it's that secondary level of playmaking. And we actually saw some from Tatum too. I want to, I want to give uh, some credit to Tatum. He did some nice playmaking against the Timberwolves too. I don't think we need everybody doing that, but if, if the more you can do that, the better. And we see this in the playoffs and I, and I bring up the words kind of half jokingly, but you need guys who can create opportunities for other players. And when you go against the, the Raptors, the Raptors are good. We know Kawhi can do it. We know Lowry can do it. Who else on that court can create a create an opportunity for others? Can Siakam do that? Much better player, not quite there. I think that that's going to 
be the difference. The more playmakers you have on your team, when it does slow down and it goes into ISO, the better off you're going to be. And I think that that's why you need to get that core five. Horford, Tatum, as a group before you get to April and feeling good. So I, yeah, I, I want to get there. I'm just not there quite yet. And I like separating the two, Hayward and, and Irving, and allowing them each to kind of run a unit, but having enough overlap in closing units so that way they are building that continuity. That was my master plan. That Boom. was my master plan from the beginning of last year heading into this year. Baines isn't in the starting lineup. This is the master plan. No, you're right. I, that's That's exactly what needs to happen. You know, we definitely have to have, uh, Hayward and Kyrie overlapping and providing that veteran sort of stability with Horford, you know, also doing the same thing, but he's a little bit different. He, he can facilitate. And last year down the stretch, they required it after Kyrie was out. So he definitely did a lot more facilitating, but facilitating, but it also came at a cost. So there is that too. And you're right. Definitely Tatum did some playmaking. Um, and I, and I'll say the thing that was happening before is they were in this really slow, half court offense and they were getting open shots, but most of those open shots were coming from the fact that the defense of the opposing team was basically daring them to go ahead and shoot from outside and they weren't hitting their open shots. And I think that's how they got a lot into that funk. Whereas now it's like, even with a little bit of overpassing or too many extra passes, when they're getting that open shot, it's just so much more in the flow of the game. It's so much more kinetic. There's so much more energy behind it. It almost fuels a certain level of confidence so that they knock down that open shot with a lot more regularity than they were just with a slow motion half court offense. It just wasn't working um, entirely. That's why I was saying they needed to push this pace push this pace, push this pace. So um, it's nice to see that kind of come to fruition. The other thing, as we wrap up the show, we're coming up on the end here. Um, we only have a couple more games. So the benefits of practice and raising that intensity. And I also think if there were, you know, some battles for minutes with this club and there was maybe a debate about, you know, who should get the minutes. Sometimes like going against each other in practice really helps them work through that and work it out. They kind of take it out on each other. And I'm hoping that that's what's kind of happening. And that's allowing some alpha dog and some competitiveness and, you know, people kind of realizing where they really are at in the pecking order. And um, I, you know, I think some of that is playing out with the extra time as well. And we're going to have more of it this week because, They've got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's right, four nights off before a game against the Knicks. Then they get Friday night off, and then they're matching up against the Bulls on Saturday night. We're going to come back and have another show before they kick to the following Monday um, when they'll face the Pelicans again. So we'll be coming back and previewing that game. But with two games on deck to finish out the uh, finish out the coming week, the Knicks on Thursday, Bulls on Saturday kind of feel like at this point, the Celtics, you know, got a couple more chumpers, a little bit more practice time. And like I said, chumpers. just a couple more chumpers. <laughs> yeah, and senior, I, I get to chumpers. Senior and chumpers. This is one of those, this is one of those perfect shows, right? Like it's just coming out. Perfect. So, but, but I want your take on what I just said, John, about, you know, I feel like this added practice time where it's kind of felt like a detriment in the past. I think that it's also allowed practice and they're probably going at each other in practice. It's sort of like laid out the pecking order a little bit. And I think it's really contributed to, you know, some of this competitiveness and confidence and, and maybe it's a lot less about how come I'm not getting the minutes. And there's been a lot more of, well, I'm earning the minutes I'm getting and I kind of can see where I'm at. You know, somebody like semi Ojale probably does deserve more time. There's just not a lot for him, but. But that's what I think is probably happening in practice. And now they've got four more days off before Thursday night's game. And I think it's going to continue to benefit them in this area. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that as well as your predictions. I'm going 2-0. Oh. Um, you know, yeah. winning streak continues. I think they're going to beat the Knicks by 30. I think they're, I think there's, there's some retribution. Knicks play hard though. Knicks they do. Play hard. They do. But I, I think that there is some really sour taste in the mouth from, from the way that Knicks game went down. Better think, be. I think Trey Burke, 
Trey Burke is going to spend a good tired part of the game on his butt. Uh, Bulls, Bulls, they're either tough or they're completely a waste of time. So we'll see. But I think you're right, two and zero on the week. Um, but in terms of you know the kind of the the bigger question, I guess of um, you know. Where are we going with that? The practices. <laughs> That's all right. The practices. And the oh, yeah, the practices. Harder. Sorry. Just yes. that extra time to go at each yeah. other and sort of like, you know, yeah. I think they're neat. I think that that has given everybody on the team a little self-realization. No, you know what I mean? I and, and then they probably like in the back of their minds have had this passive sort of irritation that somebody else is getting minutes that they should be getting, but they get to take it out on each other in practice instead of like sitting on the bench and not feeling like they can do yeah. anything about it. Sometimes well, his practices work that stuff out. I think Tice is another guy that is kind of in that same mold of, of Shemi where, you know, he's, he's had some, he's had a game or two good, but didn't play so great. I thought in the last couple, um, but let me let me the one name I think that we I've I'm kind of now uh standing for I guess and that I think it's time for Time Lord to be unleashed. You know, I, I looked at that game, uh the, the the Minnesota game, and I thought, you know, Baines 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 is great in, in that he can be in the right spot. I think he gets worn down. I think he can get to a point where he just doesn't have the lift he needs. And he's, when you're, when you're in kind of in that pick and roll and you're, and you're the big and you're trying to defend that, that, uh, the guard roll into the hoop. Um, Baines is not going to be the guy who's going to send the shot out. You know, if you can get up over his arms, you're going to have a good shot. Go off there. Time Lord, on the other hand, you'd have to put it up 20 feet and over. Um, because the guy's arms go forever and he jumps forever. I think Time Lord is a guy who I would probably start to look at. <laughs> like legitimately, there's a few people that are listening to this show who don't even know. Who know Time Lord. You Robert say Williams. Time Lord. <laughs> but Bob Williams or Robert, not Rob. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the Time Lord. Time Lord, uh, is, he needs to go in. I, I think, I felt like in that third quarter, that's a time for him to go in there. These four days, I think will be crucial, I hope, for him to be able to get some time. And I'd like to see Brad give him a chance. I mean, he's done this end of quarter thing, you know, one second left. End put of the him blowout, in. big dunk. I mean, he missed his first shot of the season just the other night against the Cavs, right? Yep. I, I'm with you though. It's the shot altering. This is the thing that we've been talking about and he's not going to demand shots and nope. he's really not going to realize how impactful his athleticism is if he doesn't get some minutes. And, and so I, I mean, no, do I think he should start? No, they'll burn him a little bit, you know, just from knowledge. But if he's not out there, they should actually try to wait. You know, for when the team takes a veteran, like I'm even thinking of like even like a Jared Dudley, somebody that he really should be able to outmatch physically, who, you know, Dudley's, you know, just ability and kind of knowledge of the game that will test the rook. But because the rookie is so athletic, he might still make up for it, even if he's a half second slow. You know, Tommy made a point during the game where he was about to, he went up to try to block a shot. And I think it actually wound up being a goaltending. And Tommy was saying, gosh, I wish he could get like, I think it was Russell he, he referred to. Yeah. I wish it could be like Russell where he blocks the ball. Well, he was, he was blowing up Cowens in that game for athleticism yes. too. Yes. But, but he said, I wish, I think it was Russell he was referring to. I wish he'd, you know, kind of, you know, get, the, get the swat, you know, when the ball's like two to five inches, you know, from the player's hand on the release. And then literally a few minutes later, that's exactly what Williams did. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and so, but that's, that's the kind of adjustment that come with just playing time and experience. And, and so I'd like to see him, you know, kind of throw him out there, you know, on that bench unit when the guy, that he's, you know, maybe the power forward slash centers that are out there are veterans that are experienced but never had crazy athleticism and figure that they're going to at least equalize on that, but that Williams is going to learn a lot about veteran savvy. He's going to get chumped by a guy a couple of times that he really shouldn't, Mm -hmm. and then that's going to break in his knowledge of the game. And that's what I really think, you know, he's not going to demand shots, so that's exactly what that should happen with him in my opinion. Well, and this is the time when Brad experiments. You know, he always uses more players now than and not. I think he's used less probably than he normally would because of the fact he's trying to build that continuity. And this might be that time this this easy schedule. We get 4 days off. We're going to have two easy games. 
maybe this is the time when you can unleash him a little bit in those second those second units. Maybe dial Bain's time down a little bit here over the next you know few games or the next week. Try to get him a breather. He really hasn't had much of one. Um, you know, yeah, have a matchup against for, Noah Vonla. You know, Vonlay, sorry, at, against yeah. the Knicks. You know what I mean? Even the Bulls. You know, like Lori Marginen is just coming back, but. You know, who do they have in the middle? Right. Portis. Are you worried Portis? about, you know, Bobby Portis? Are you worried about, I mean, I, I, that's the thing is like, I, I, you know, we, we got, you know, in the Knicks, the Knicks have their own little wonderkind, uh, you know, big guy who can, who can, you know, Mitchell Robinson, who can, you know, swat shots around. Let, let, let's see those guys have a little exhibition. I mean, he did quite a bit in that second quarter of the Knicks game to kind of turn things around. I'd like to see, let's throw some athleticism at him and, and see what he can do against, uh, you know, the Time Lord and as he's changed his time, in time to alter shots. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I, it's, t- I think it's, I think it's time. Uh, for him to get out there, you know. <laughs> it's time, Lord. <laughs> I know, but I, you know, I really do. I really do think. Give him some time. If he doesn't do well, it's okay. He kind of goes back to the bench. He thinks about it. He, you know. Remember to the same point that you had earlier, which I thought was a good one about Morris and trying to get everybody else going. Baines is a one year. He has a chance to opt out as well and and to not take the second year, so he could be gone this summer and. Very, very reasonably, Robert Williams could be your starting, you know, not your starting center, but your second, your second. Yeah, he could be competing for it. He could season. be competing for it unless, you know, cause you never know what's going to happen with that lineup. It seems like it'll be Horford starting at center, but you just never know with these things. But he's your second center. I mean, and if you Definitely, had two bigs, yeah. he's going to be your guy if Baines. And, and they're Tyson really happy with it. Happen. Despite all the late flights and the late practice and all that craziness around summer league, seems like they're really happy with him. I don't, and we haven't heard so, anything behavioral. Since then, and he's around, you know, some young guys, so he fits into the club. And at right. the same time, there's enough veterans, and especially the one that Jeff Goodman said on this show on draft night would be the most influential for him in Al Horford. You know, he's got some good influences around him, so that's obviously helpful as well. But we'll be back next week, um, right before or, or uh, right before the game against the Pelicans. We'll have had two in the books at that point, um, two hopefully easy ones in the Knicks and the Bulls. We'll be previewing a fairly recent rematch again. Against New Orleans, and obviously the trade rumors will have to kick up again before that. Even though um, we'll have to be told the rule about why the Celtics can't trade for the brow. <laughs> so anyway, all good stuff. Join us next week. This broadcast will be available on demand on the CLNS Media Mobile app, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at CSL underscore Justin and at CSL underscore Duke. A heartfelt thank you to everybody for tuning in, and remember that you can help support the show by subscribing to Celtic Stuff Live on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd love it if you gave us a rating or review because your feedback is important to the show. For staff writers. Samuel Elias, executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of CLNS Media, Nick Gelso, and my co-host John Duke. I'm Justin Poulin. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of Celtic Stuff Live. Celtic Stuff Live. Dude, that was awesome. That was a machine gun. <laughs> oh my god. Let's see who's really sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you remember? Do you remember the commercial? Me of, do you remember the commercial for the auction house that we had way back when? I think it was one of JB's buddies. Yes. Oh my gosh! Yes. I had Godsmack. Like it was. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> the guy was like, "Can I get a fifty-five? Can I get a fifty-five hundred? Who no, no, no. <laughs> Great show. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to put this on the show. Let's see who sticks around and listens to this one. Yeah, right. You won't. You won't do it. You don't dare. You don't I'm dare doing listen it. to this. I'm doing they it. don't dare listen. They don't dare hear this. this we got two stuff. people stuck around last the time. Gold. This is the gold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a great way to keep people around after the end of the show, right? We have like a little outtakes re- wrap after That's the right. It's like the end of Smokey and the Bandit when Burt Bert Reynolds put all the outtakes in, you know? Yeah, all the Marvel movies are doing it, right? <laughs> That's right. Yes. That's like our thing. Tells you a little bit about next week's show. <laughs> next week. <laughs> some sort of teaser. <laughs> Captain Marvel is going to be in our next show, just in case you're curious. I'm pretty sure Time Lord is – is it's, this time is Lord. definitely oh, – <laughs> this, this, is, is, this is Time Lord's time. <laughs> all right. That's a wrap.